Again, if I can just remind members, um, if you can remove your phones from the microphone, because I'm already hearing interference. Up here now, are you? And if you can just put them on to the, the silent mode, so um, unlike me, you don't disturb the, the committee meeting. Um, but yes, if you can just keep them away, these microphones are particularly sensitive, and uh, bear that in mind whenever you're talking to your neighbour as well. <laughs> um, less is more sometimes. So we'll proceed then um, in terms of the statutory rules. Members have them all there. We're going to attempt to get through these um, today. And the first one that we want to deal with uh, is item two, or just sorry, Paul, for you sends his apologies. Um, he may be here uh, shortly if there's any other apologies. Sure, can I just make an apology? I'm going to have to step out at about half twelve okay. for, for, for about an hour. Yep. Raymond. Raymond is running late, Jeff. No problem. Okay, so the uh, the first agenda item is the statutory rule on pages six to twelve of the meeting pack. Um, this rule uh, is one of 28 that's on the agenda for today's meeting. The examiner for statutory rules will report uh, the findings on the technical elements of the stat rule in the near future. Normally, the committee would uh, would not consider this rule as report is available. However, uh, as you're aware, the statutory time period within which the committee can scrutinise these rules is limited, so they're on the agenda for today's uh, consideration. Uh, this rule amends the Police Act 1997 Criminal Records Disclosure Regulations Northern Ireland 2008, which sets out the fees payable for each type of certificate issued by Access NI and the Police Act of 1997 Criminal Records Registration Regulations 2007, which sets out the fees payable for registration of first and additional persons with Access NI. Uh, in terms of the substance, uh, the statutory rule reduces the fee payable for a basic and standard disclosure from £26 to £18. Mm. It increases the fees for registration of an organisation with access NI from £150 to £195. Uh, it increases the fee for registration of any individual person as a counter signatory within an organisation from £10 to £13. Access NI is required to ensure that, as far as possible, the service does not attract a surplus or a loss and a review of its financial model identified that these fee changes were needed. The rule is subject to negative resolution. Um, the absence of the committee has prevented any consideration of the rule taking place prior to being made on the 4th of March last year. So, If members are content with this rule, it is pretty self-explanatory, I will put the question formally. That the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019-28 the Police Act 1997 Criminal Records Fees Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019 and subject to the Examiner for Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, the next one is on pages 14 to 21. The, following the UK's exit from the European Union, the legal basis for joint investigation teams which facilitate the coordination of criminal investigations and prosecutions conducted in parallel by two or more countries will be provided in most cases by the second protocol to the Convention of the European Convention on Mutual Assistance in Criminal Matters, 1959, um, owing to gaps in the ratification by four EU member states, namely Italy, Greece, Luxembourg and Slovakia. This rule is required to provide the legal basis to ensure that uh, JITs, otherwise known as Joint Investigation Teams, uh, with these four member states retain the same powers and operational capability. Uh, the rule does not make any changes to powers or introduce any new powers. The rule again is subject to negative resolution and it was laid on the 8th of March 2019. So if members are content um, with this uh, rule subject to the findings of the examiner of the statutory rules, then I formally put the question to the committee, unless there are any questions. If not, um, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 40, the International Joint Investigation Teams, International Agreements, EU Exit Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, for the next one, members, um, I've asked for officials to come forward just to look at uh, these three statutory rules. It's in respect of enforcement. Um, so, if those officials would like to, to make their way to the table. Uh, it's in respect of enforcement of fines and other penalties. 
and it relates to uh, the civilianisation of the enforcement um, agencies that deal with this matter. So I just thought it would be beneficial if we were able to get a, a briefing on this. So the relevant papers, members, are uh, from pages uh, 23 through until 111. Uh, they're being introduced to support the commencement of Part 1 of the Justice Act uh, 2016, uh, which introduced a new system of collection of unpaid fines and other financial penalties aimed at reducing levels of unpaid debt and prison committals for what, if often relatively low level offending. Civilian collection officers are given powers to deal with defaulters under the authority of a collection order made by the court at the point of imposing a financial penalty or registering a penalty uh, for enforcement. So let me welcome Angela Bell to the meeting. Um, and I'm going to invite Angela just to give us a, a brief overview of the three statutory rules that the committee need to consider. Thank you, Thank you Angela. Yes, as you say, the three uh, rules come as a bundle as part of the implementation of Part 1 of the Justice Act 2016, which introduced a new system of collection and enforcement of unpaid fines. Um, the first instrument in front of you is uh, revocations instrument. It's really quite a technical uh, piece of legislation. It only removes provisions that we no longer need because the new provisions in the 2016 Act and the other regulations now supersede them and replace the content that was in them. Pre previously, those uh, two instruments that are being revoked made provision in relation to the uh, procedure for the enforcement of unpaid fixed penalties and penalty notices. Um, the 2016 Act created a system whereby any unpaid criminal debt became enforceable as if it were a fine. So there's now just one system of enforcement which is, say, is included in the new system. Um, and so the, the two instruments that we had before can be done without and have been revoked accordingly. Okay, thank you. Okay for that one. Uh, the next one is the enforcement regulations, which really give a lot more detail of the um, provisions in the Act. So the Act introduced new uh, options for the enforcement fines, and those included deductions from benefits, attachment of earnings orders, um, bank account orders, and both seizure orders. And each of those included uh, delegated power to make regulations to flesh out the details of how they would work. And that's what the regulations do. Again, very procedural, really, in, in, in their um, substance. Um, maybe if I go through the, the regulations are set out in four parts to make it easy to follow. So in those uh, four headings, deductions for benefits, attachment for earnings, bank account orders and vehicle seizure orders. The deductions from benefits part is relatively short because uh, Department of Rural Communities are responsible for benefits and they had a separate power to make um, their own regulations in relation to the levels of deductions from benefits. So the regulations that we made only set out what the content of a deductions order will be. Um, and also say that we will be required to advise the, the uh, Department for Communities when a fine is paid off and they no, no longer need to make deductions. That's the first part. Then moving on to the attachment of earnings orders. Um, again, very procedural. You'll see that they set out a requirement of what information is to be included in a statement of earnings, which is required by the court to understand what kind of fine it may be able to impose. Um, they set out what the content of an attachment of earnings sh order should be. There is a provision about the rate of deductions from persons' earnings set out in Schedule 2 of the regulations. Um, those were based on a very recent piece of legislation brought by Department for Communities in relation to direct earnings attachments. And we thought it was wise to retain some kind of um, consistency across the statute book and so replicate the same levels of deductions. Um, we had thought of a previous uh, Enforcement of Judgments Office model, but it was much more complicated and we felt that employers would find it much more easy to follow the simple rates that we set out in the, in the table in Schedule 2. We did have an alternative 
approach for anybody who felt they could afford to pay a higher amount. So we've also allowed for a debtor to pay um, an agreed amount, which would be higher than that set out in the table, if they so wish. But that's entirely up to them if, if they want to pay off the debt more quickly. There is a protected earnings level also of 60% of the uh, debtor's net income so that there will never be hopefully a situation where they're in terrible hardship and paying off their fine. Um, the regulations then also stipulate who the attachment earnings organ must be served on, so it must be served on the debtor and his employer, and the uh, procedure for any applications to the court to determine whether certain payments are earnings that would be subject to an attachment order. They also set out how employers should make payments, what to do if they over or underpay, and they allow employers uh, a small administrative cost for each time they make a payment of just one pound. Um, there's also procedures set out if the debtor wishes to vary an order, and also reasons and procedure for discharging an order. That covers the attachment of earnings orders as part of the regulations. And then moving on to part three is the bank account orders. So a bank account order is where a, um, a court service is aware that the debtor has money in the bank but is refusing to pay the fine. Um, they can then initially freeze the amount of the fine, just the amount of the fine, in the person's bank account if they have that amount. Um, that can be done by a collection officer. but. For money to be actually paid over to the court, the court has to make an order in a, a full bank account order. So the regulations set out all the procedure for making an interim bank account order, and then very similarly, the same procedure for making a bank account order. So it, requires, it sets out the information banks can be asked to provide, um, what the content of a, an order will include, and also how it will be served. Um, obligations on the banks when they receive a uh, service of an order and also the procedure when the debtor wishes to pay the fine instead of having the bank account order made. There's also a provision to uh, provide some protection for debtor again. They can make an application for a hardship payment if they feel that they can't pay essential outgoings while the money has been frozen in their bank account. And provides that um, after an interim bank account order is made by the collection officer, the full hearing of the bank account order must be within 28 days so that the person is not left in a position where their bank account is frozen for an extended period. Um, the regulations go on then to uh, set out the information banks must give to the court and the content of service of the full bank account order, the rules for its implementation and again allows the bank to make an administrative charge if they are required to actually implement a bank account order. And finally, then, vehicle seizure orders. A vehicle seizure order was seen uh, as probably the last uh, attempt at enforcement that the collection officer could consider um, before the matter would be referred back to the court again. So if the debtor has a vehicle that he's the sole owner of, which is not used for somebody with particular vulnerabilities or it's not used uh, for a disabled person or for um, emergency purposes, um, the court, on the recommendation of the collection officer, can make a vehicle seizure order. Um, the vehicle must be worth at least as much as the outstanding fine plus any costs that are required to be paid. Um, and the regulations then set out what the content of the vehicle service uh, sorry, vehicle seizure order should include and how it should be served. Um, places where vehicles may be seized, so the police or the people who may seize a vehicle, they can enter private premises to seize, seize a vehicle or they can seize a vehicle in any public place. There's a procedure if the debtor disputes vehicle seizure order and a procedure um, for when the vehicle is removed to storage and how the vehicle is stored and released upon application when the debt is paid. Um, also then provision as to what happens if the payment of the fine is not made. Uh, so after 28 days, the vehicle may be sold or disposed of, and then the proceeds of sale will be used to pay off the outstanding debt. Um, table one in schedule one sets out the charges that are payable 
to the person removing and storing and disposing of the vehicle. And again, those are based on existing figures in um, DFI regulations in relation to vehicles which are prohibited from being used on the roads in Northern Ireland. So again, keeping consistency across the statute, but it uh, keeps things nice and simple for people and they can understand what's being required of them. And finally, then the regulations set out all the forms that are to be used in connection with all of these applications. Is that you, Angela? That's the regulations and thirdly there's a set of court rules as well, the amendment rules. Again, quite technical in their um, content. The magistrate's court's rules <coughs> set out procedures to be followed in the magistrate's courts. Um, so when a fine is imposed, we needed to have those procedures just amended from what previously existed before the 2016 Act came into effect. So the rules uh, amend the Magistrate's Court's order to provide a, for a new notice of the fine, setting out um, the details of the collection order and the consequences of non-payment so the debtor knows what he's facing if he doesn't pay. Um, it removes all of those separate procedures that had ex existed for the fixed penalties and penalty notices that we talked about in the earlier regulations and sets out the uh, form of and how a uh, collection order should be served. It also gives the, the rules for the form and the service of a summons for the debtor to attend uh, a meeting with the collection officer and also the form and summons uh, service provisions for a summons for a default hearing to court. Um, also arrest warrants and notification of a referral hearing order and also then the procedure and form of appeal against a collection officer's decision. So those are just amendments to the, the existing magistrate's court's rules to bring them into line with the new procedures. Okay. That's you, Angela. Great, thank you. Um, just, just a couple of general, and I appreciate you going into a lot of the detail around this, um, but just a couple of general points. One, um, if you are in a position to answer, has the new system been more effective than the previous system. Obviously, we changed this in 2016. It flowed from the legislation. I can yeah. recall at the time a lot of debate about police resources yes. being spent, uh, a lot of time on, on trying to deal with fine defaulters, and also people going to prison for mm -hmm. non-payment of fines, um, and that they were two significant issues that we wanted to change so that actually we had a more effective system for collecting fines and avoiding people. Um, going to prison for a very short period of time to avoid fines. Mm -hmm. So, I'm not sure if you can give a, a, an overall commentary on the effectiveness of the changes. Yes, well, the responsibility for the operation and monitoring of the arrangements does lie with court service, but I have got some information I can share with the committee at this stage. I believe they're actually up next week, so perhaps further information will come then. Um, but as far as the new arrangements are concerned at the minute, they have... Um, it came into operation in 2018, so there was a sort of a, a gradual uptake. Um, since the implementation, over 48,000 collection orders have been made, um, and of those, or over 4,500 deductions from benefits orders have been made, and um, about 1,800 attachment of earnings orders. So there's quite a good uptake in those two disposals, which are the first um, sort of options the collection officer will go to once a person goes into default. Um, the, I suppose, I don't want to call it the downside, but the effect of that is that because money is coming in on in small increments, the overall amount coming in in one go seems to be smaller, but that isn't really a good reflection on how effective the arrangements are because there are those numbers of orders made and being processed. So I think is it around £13 million currently owed? There's a little bit more than that now, but I think that was to be expected because of the bedding in of the new arrangements and, as I say, the, the way the money is being now collected. Um, but also there's been a, a, a review of the procedures within court service and they've um, brought in some extra staff onto the collection team and they've reviewed procedures and they're working with HMRC and DFC to uh, improve the, their access to the information so that they can decide whether or not an attachment order is appropriate. The collection officers are DOJ employees? They are, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Prison okay. receptions have, have dropped markedly. Huh. Um, in 2018, they were down to 349, and in 2019, 
153. So that's quite a. In respect of what was that? Sorry. In respect of prison receptions yeah. for people who have uh, defaulted solely on, on fine. Yeah. So that was one of the things we were really hoping. Well, that's welcome because it was people seem to be able to get in when there was a bank holiday and they could only sometimes That's they were right. in and out on the same That's day. Right. And then the other change that was made in the Act was that remission no longer applies for those uh -huh. sentences. So the person if the person is required to serve seven days, they will serve seven days as opposed to the three and a half days that they would have yeah. had previously. Okay. Thank you. Um, Linda? It's okay actually the question I was going to ask has been answered. Okay. Thank you. Patsy? Okay, thanks Chair. Uh, just a wee point of clarification. Um, as you know your table here of deduction rates in respect of the earnings or the deduction tables. Mm -hmm. um, what I wanted to find out is um, that refers to a collection order. Is it still the same rate if there are multiple collection, more than one collection order? Um, no, the, the court service have taken the view that they will only apply one attachment of earnings order at a time. Right. So the person won't be disadvantaged. To um, having bigger deductions taken off. This oh, is for earnings, someone, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to work this through in my head. Say someone has a debt which eventually winds up in court. Mm -hmm. The court will not, if there is another collection order, are you telling me the court will not apply a second collection order? No, the, sorry, the collection orders will accumulate, but right. if the collection officer considers that an attachment of earnings order is the appropriate method of collection, uh -huh. they will only apply one attachment of earnings order at a time. At that rate? At these rates? At these rates. All right, they okay. Will, they will just work through in, in time sequence, yes, so okay. once one's paid off, the next one. Okay, thank again. you. Thanks, Chair. Okay. No other... Yes, Doug? Yeah, can I ask a very quick question, and, and, and this might be an unfair question, but it just, it just sort of dawned on me. Um, how, do we, how do we operate this on a cross-border basis? For example, if somebody from the Irish Republic has a fine which is due in Northern Ireland, um, but obviously resides in the Irish Republic, is there, is there a way of, of this, um, and vice versa, I have to say, um, it, you know, fines in, in the Irish Republic? Um, there are reciprocal arrangements between us and England, Scotland and Wales. Yes. Um, where the same arrangements would apply. I'm afraid I don't know the answer in respect of the South of Ireland. Okay. So so, so anybody who, who incurs a series of road traffic fines in the Irish Republic but resides in Northern Ireland, there's no method to... It's very difficult to serve the summonses. We, we don't have uh, a process whereby we can effectively serve a summons across the border. Is that a gap in the...? It's a problem that we're aware of. Yeah. Um, and court service have been working to try and resolve. Okay. But okay. It's, it's something I say. Well, we are aware of that. That difficulty. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Linda just wants to pick up on that. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but I know that in the past, and I'm talking about probably a fair few years ago, that there was they would have sold that debt to a debtor company. So, if, for example, you got a parking fine in the south, you they would have sold that debt to an English debtor company to, to chase you up then for the for the debt. And I don't know how you know and, and I think that's still that I think out, that's still the case, Linda. But I mean I don't know if it's the same for so the certainly, certainly certainly you know on the on the minor scale, if you pick up a fine on the N fifty for example, that they'll pass that debt to, to a company in England, but I don't know the rules and regulations and how enforceable that actually is. But different rabbit hole I think. That'd be a, a wider point we could look at. Mm -hmm. yeah. Gordon? Thanks, Chair, and thanks very much for your information. Just in uh, Schedule 3, the charges for vehicles, um, removal, storage and disposal, that generally is carried out by a contractor. Are these the maximum fees that would be applicable? Yes, but those, those are the fees which will be applicable, Applicable, yes. Yeah, that's, those are the maximum then. Yes. They cannot charge anything in excess of these. That's correct. Yeah. They operate that on behalf of the department and the contractors, which we're seeing more and more of with people, obviously, tax evasion and so on. People now are getting stamped, their vehicles removed, so it is you know, more and more an issue. So those are the levels of charges that are now applicable. That's right, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, okay members. Angela, can I thank you very much? That was very helpful to the committee. Thank you. Okay. Members, I'll, I'll take... Oh these in turn in terms of the, the three rules that we need to consider. So let me just go to the first one. Um, this was the 
statutory rule revoking the road traffic fixed penalties regulations 1997 and penalty notices regulations 2012, um, which made provision in relation to the procedures to be followed on the registration of such penalties. These are no longer required as the new arrangements supersede their provision. Again, the rule is subject to negative resolution. So I uh, will formally put the question uh, to members that the Committee for Justice consider SR 2018 forward slash 100, the enforcement of fines and other penalties, revocations order Northern Ireland 2018 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. The next one. Um, this rule makes provision in relation to the content of an application for deductions from benefits, attachment of earnings orders, bank account orders, vehicle seizures orders. Again, the rule is subject to negative resolution. Uh, if members are content, then I will formally put the, the question uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 102, the enforcement of fines and other penalties regulations in Northern Ireland uh, 2018, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Great. Great. And finally, the Magistrate Court's rules. This rule amends the Magistrate Court rules in 1984 to prescribe court procedures to be followed in relation to the collection and enforcement of fines or other financial penalties. It also makes provision in relation to the court procedure to be followed when a person wishes to bring an appeal in relation to enforcement action under the new provisions. Um, existing court forms are also amended and new forms prescribed. As required, again, the rule is subject to negative resolution. And if members are content, then I'll formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 103, the Magistrate Court's Amendment No. 2 rules Northern Ireland 2018 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection uh, to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, thank you. Angela, thank you. Okay, members, the next item is the Protection of Freedom Act. Uh, Freedoms Act 2012, uh, papers 113 to 119. Uh, chapter 5 of the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012 makes provision for a person who has a conviction or caution for certain consensual offences with persons over 17 to apply to the Department of Justice to have that conviction or caution uh, disregarded. Uh, the rule prescribes the following. Which records of convictions and cautions, other than the main database of police and criminal records, are relevant? Official records, which will be deleted, should an application for a disregard be successful. These have been identified as court records and any other locally held police records. The relevant data controllers in relation to those official records and for certain records to be annotated uh, rather than deleted. The rule is subject to negative resolution and was laid in June 2018. If the members are content with the statutory rule, I will formally put the question. Uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 129, the Protection of Freedoms Act 2012, relevant official records order Northern Ireland 2018, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Next item uh, <coughs> Criminal uh, Justice Act 98, <coughs> reviews of sentencing order. The pages is 121 to 133. This rule arises from a review and consultation by the Department of Justice of the unduly lenient sentence provisions, which provides for the direct <coughs> prosecution uh, with the leave of the Court of Appeal to refer certain cases to that court, where the DPP considers that the sentences imposed were unduly lenient. The review identified relevant offences linked to terrorism, organised crime and paramilitarism, which were not capable of referral. This rule provides for sentences imposed in the Crown Court for offences that are specified in the order to be referred to the Court of Appeal by the DPP, where he considers the sentence passed to be unduly lenient. It also extends the range of offences in respect of which that power may be exercised by the DPP in Northern Ireland to include offences tried in the Crown Court that can be linked to terrorism and organised crime gangs. Uh, again, the rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in July 2019. Um, if members are content with this statutory rule, um, which I certainly am content with when I look at the, the broad number of offences that can now be referred by the DPP if unduly lenient, I'm surprised that it never was the case. However, it now is, and I welcome that. Um, so if members are content, I will formally put the question to the Committee uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 131. The Criminal Justice Act 1998 reviews of sentencing order Northern Ireland 2019 and subject to the examiner of statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. <coughs> Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the next item, uh, pages 134 to 144. 
uh, the Rehabilitation of Offenders, Offenders Order 1978 makes it possible for certain convictions to become spent, and after a specified period, a person can be treated for certain purposes as if the conviction never happened, and they need not, for example, disclose that conviction to an employer when applying for a, jo a job. And there is a filtering system operated in this regard. The statutory rule is in response to a Supreme Court judgment that ruled that limiting the filter scheme operated by the Department of Justice to a single offence, with the result that more than one old and minor conviction would be disclosed automatically, automatically was disproportionate. This rule, therefore, adjusts the terms of the scheme to allow more than one offence to be filtered. The Department is satisfied that public protection is maintained, as the remaining elements of the filtering scheme will continue to ensure that there is no increased risk to the public as a result of this change. Again, the rule is subject to negative resolution and was laid in December 2019. Members are uh, content. I will formally put the question. That the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 214, the Rehabilitation of Offenders Exemption, Exceptions Amendment Order, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Next item, members, um, the rules of the Court of Judicature, uh, pages 146 to 154. The rules amend Order 53, Rule 4. Brackets 1 of the Rules of the Court of Judicature, Northern Ireland 1980, to remove the re requirement of promptitude from the time limit for lodging an application for <coughs> to apply for judicial review, with the result that the time limit is three months from the date from which grounds for the application first arose, unless, they, unless extended by the Court. This will ensure clarity and legal certainty. Again, the rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in October 2017. Uh, so it just specifies three months. Uh, it was always understood that a prompt application uh, meant three months, but it needed to have it laid out specifically uh, just to provide that clarity. So that's what this rule relates to. So unless members have any other questions, I'll put the, the formal question to the committee. Uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2017 forward slash 213, the rules of the Court of Judicature, Northern Ireland Amendment 2017, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> You're doing a good job, Gordon. <laughs> the, the damages for bit um, lonely. Always do. bereavement variation sum order Northern Ireland 2019 is pages 156 to 163. Uh, this relates to when a person dies as a result of an accident. Uh, their common law right of action against the negligent person dies with them. However, under the Fatal Accidents Northern Ireland Order of 1977, where a death has been caused by another person's negligence, there is a statutory right for the deceased person's dependents to claim for damages, and a limited category of people may also claim for a fixed award of damages for bereavement. If the claim for negligence is successful, the damages are paid. Uh, by the defendant. <coughs> the Department of Finance is responsible for the substantive law on damages, but the Department of Justice is responsible for setting the fixed amount of bereavement damages under the 1977 order. The purposes of this rule is to increase the level of bereavement award in line with inflation, as measured by CPI, rounded to the nearest £100. And based on the CPI for February 2019, this increases the sum that may be awarded for damages uh, for bereavement in Northern Ireland from £14,200 to £15,100 for causes of action arising on or after the 1st of May. 2019. Again, the rule is subject to uh, negative resolution. It was laid in April of 2019. So, if members are content, I um, will put the question formally that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 80, the damages for bereavement variation of some order Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the examiner of statutory rules, report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay, members. The next item, uh, the, no, the next five items, we're going to have officials that are going to come and uh, address the meeting. So, uh, I think it's Joe that's going to handle that, just as she's coming. Um, <coughs> these next items, members, uh, to do with statutory rules, are all in your meeting pack from. Uh, let me see the pages. 165. Um, through until 212. They relate to amendments to court rules uh, to remove provisions re which relate to powers, processes and orders 
under European Union instruments and treaties that will no longer be applicable in the event that the UK exits the EU without uh, a withdrawal agreement. Um, so officials, Joe is here uh, just to, to give us a brief on this. Um, I'd ask for Joe to come because obviously the primary issue here is this relates to provisions in the event that there is no withdrawal bill or agreement, and there now is. So I just wanted some clarity as to the necessity of passing these statutory rules, given that there is a withdrawal bill now taking place. So I'm not sure, Joe, if you had planned to go through each rule or whether you just uh, want to address the gener general point. These are just really tiny pieces in the bigger jigsaw puzzle of ensuring that the UK's statute book is coherent should the UK uh, leave the EU without a deal. And, um, <clears throat> The rules are drafted so that they'll come into force on exit day. Um, so we would have thought that was going to be the 31st of January uh, this Friday. Um, however, under the um, legislation that was passed and uh, received royal assent last week, um, the um, European Union Withdrawal Agreement Act, and they've got a really clever whiz, and they've actually have provided that any statutory instrument that was due to come into force on exit day is now being deferred until the end of the implementa implementation period under the any withdrawal agreement that the UK will have with the EU. So as it stands, that will be the 31st of December 2020. So the rules are there should the UK, at, at the end of the implementation period, leave the EU without a deal. Um, so that, that, that covers the general point that I, <laughs> that I wanted to understand. <laughs> So it. I, I don't intend to go through each individual rule because they're all very um, straightforward. Um, unless members have any question you want to raise with Joe, I'm content to proceed. So, Joe, thank you. Okay, members, um, I'll just go through each one then. First one's SR 2019-233. Uh, this rule amends the Crown Court rules of 1979 to remove the provisions which relate to the process for referral to the Court of Justice of the European Union, which will no longer be applicable in the event the UK exits the European Union without a withdrawal agreement. Uh, this rule again is subject to negative resolution and was laid in December uh, of last year. Um, under legislation related to the UK's withdrawal from the EU, the rules are deferred until completion of the implementation period under any agreement between the UK and EU on the UK's withdrawal from the EU, as Joe has outlined to members. So, members are content and to proceed. I'll formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 233, the Crown Court Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. 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 The next one, um, 2019 forward slash 234, this rule <coughs> amends the County Court Rules Northern Ireland 1981 uh, to remove provisions which relate to powers, processes and orders under EU instruments or treaties, which are no longer applicable in the event of the UK exiting the EU without a withdrawal agreement, subject to negative resolution. Um, again, this uh, legislation relating to the UK's withdrawal from the EU, these rules will be deferred until completion of the implementation period. Subject. Uh, if members are content then to proceed, I formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 234, the County Court Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Family Proceedings Rules. This rule revokes redundant provisions in the Family Proceedings Rules Northern Ireland 1996, which relate to powers, processes and orders under EU instruments or treaties, which are no longer applicable in the event of the UK exiting the EU without a withdrawal agreement. Uh, the rule is subject to negative resolution. Uh, and again, under this legislation related to UK's withdrawal, the rules are deferred until the completion of the implementation period under any agreement with the UK and EU. So if members are content, I will put the question formally uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 235, the Family Proceedings Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. 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 
The next one is the rules of the Court of Judicature. Uh, this rule revokes redundant provisions in the, in the rules of the Court of Judicature, Northern Ireland 1980, uh, relating to powers, processes and orders under EU instruments or treaties which are no longer applicable in the event of the UK exit in the EU without a withdrawal agreement. It provides the process and procedure for applications under the Hague Choice of Court Convention on choice of court agreements made between parties to international commercial contracts following the UK becoming an independent contracting party to the Convention in preparation for its withdrawal from the European Union. Uh, the rule is subject to negative resolution. Uh, the rules relating to the implementation of uh, Hague 2005 came into operation on the 13th of January this year under legislation related to the UK's withdrawal from the EU operation of the remainder of the rules is deferred until completion of the implementation period between the UK and EU. Uh, if members are content, I will proceed to put the question formally. That the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 237, the rules of the Court of Judicature, Northern Ireland Amendment 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Next item relates to Magistrate Courts. Um, the rules amend the Magistrate Courts uh, Rules of 1986 and the Magistrate Court Rules of 1996 to remove provisions which relate to powers, processes and orders under EU instruments or treaties which will, which will no longer be applicable in the event that the UK exits the EU without a withdrawal agreement. This rule is subject to negative uh, resolution. Again, uh, under the legislation related to the UK's withdrawal from the EU, these rules would be deferred until completion of the implementation period agreed between the UK and the EU. And if members are content, I'll formally put the question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 238, the Magistrate Court's Miscellaneous Amendments Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members. Um, We'll move on then to the, the next item, which is the Valuation Tribunal Rules 2018, page 214 to 224 uh, of your meeting pack deals with this issue. Uh, this rule amends the Valuation Tribunal Rules um, 2007 as a result of a rate rebate replacement scheme arising from universal credit that targets support to those least able to pay rates in conjunction with welfare reform principles of fairness and making work pay. The rules amends the 2007 rules. In consequence of the introduction of a right of appeal to the Tribunal against the result of a review by the Department of Finance of a decision made in relation to rate relief under Regulation 18 of the Rate Relief Regulations uh, 2017 legislation, consequential to the revocation in 2009 of the Rate Relief Regulations. Uh, 2007 and revocation in 2011 of the rate relief uh, and rate relief regulations 2010 and to correct a drafting error. The rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in March of 2018. So if members are content to proceed, I will put the formal question that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2018 forward slash 44. Valuation Tribunal Amendment Rules Number 2018 and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Next item is the Judicial Pension Regulations, pages 226 to 235 of your meeting pack. The purpose of this rule is to extend the current member contribution rates and learning thresholds for Northern Ireland Judicial Pension Scheme for a one year period. On the 1st of April 2019 to the end of March this year. Uh, this rule is subject to negative resolution. The Public uh, Service Pensions Act 2014, under which the regulations are made, allows the use of negative procedure uh, if the Pension Board for that scheme has stated that it considers the regulations to be minor or wholly uh, beneficial. Uh, the Northern Ireland Judicial Pension Scheme Board has confirmed that they are content that these amendments are minor. Uh, consequentially, the Department intends to make these regulations for the extension of member contribution rates and earning thresholds for a one-year period through the negative resolution procedure. Normally, members, it would be through the affirmative uh, procedure, uh, but given this assessment, uh, we are proceeding with uh, the approach that is outlined. 
So if members are content, I'll formally put the question to members that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 26, the Judicial Pensions Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, the next three items um, we will uh, take together, and then I will put the questions separately in respect of these three statutory rules. Um, just to advise members, uh, pages 237 through until 263 uh, are the relevant information in your, or to 281 in your meeting pack. Um, these relate to the Mental Capacity Act 2016. It applies to people that are aged 16 or over uh, and considers their capacity to make decisions about their health, welfare or finances <coughs> and the safeguards that must be put in place if they lack the capacity to do so. It also provides a framework for decision making by the health and social care trusts in respect of various interventions in a person's life, including the deprivation of liberty. The framework includes a right of appeal against a decision authorising an intervention to a review tribunal. Um, SR 2019-165 was laid on September 2019 and, the scheduled, uh, and was scheduled to come into operation on the 1st of October of 2019 to coincide with the partial commencement of the Mental Capacity Act by the Department of Health. The purpose of that rule was to rename the current Mental Health Review Tribunal as the Review Tribunal to allow it to take on the additional role of considering appeals against authorisation for deprivation uh, of liberty and considering applications for the appointment uh, or removal of a nominated person under the Mental Capacity Act, and to introduce a right to appeal an authorisation of deprivation of liberty or apply for the appointment uh, or revocation of a nominated person under the Mental Capacity Act. However, the Department took the decision to delay the partial commencement of the Mental Capacity Act to allow the Health and Social Care Trusts to make further preparations to manage their responsibilities uh, under the Act. Um, the revocation of the Review Tribunal uh, was therefore necessary and was achieved through another statutory rule. Uh, which, made, which was made by the Department of Justice on September 2019, and that came into operation in October. <coughs> Following the partial commencement of the Mental Capacity Act by the Department of Health on uh, the 2nd of December, the Department made then uh, a subsequent statutory rule provision uh, relating to the Review Tribunal and the right to appeal, and this rule came into operation on the 2nd of December. So, in a nutshell, the statutory rule was to be introduced. They then needed another statutory rule to delay it, and then they brought forward another statutory rule, uh, which is in line with the original one that was intended. But we need to approve all three statutory rules to give effect to that. Patsy. Yeah, Chair, thanks very much for that. Um, it, I think it would be helpful if we, maybe at some stage, Chair, if we could make the suggestion that we have a uh, review or uh, a presentation from the Department and the outworkings of the Mental Capacity Bill. I know some of us who sat through a lot of that stuff would like to hear, because um, particularly, I'm glad you touched upon the issue of the trusts there and the function and role of the tribunals because um, I hear some of the consequentials of that are that people are being called to court who aren't fit to go to court, physically fit to go to court. Um, so I think it would be very helpful if we heard about the outworkings of that and um, what uh, glitches that might be in the system or what issues are arising. If that, if that would be useful, Chair. Yeah, well, we'll certainly factor that into the work of the committee. Linda? Yeah, I think that, that Patsy is right, and given that I, I wasn't involved in anything previously, I, I would like to have a, a better understanding of it. And just, I noticed in, in the briefing as well that there were some concerns raised around young people and the impact on them. So I think that kind of a review could give us the information on whether there actually was a negative impact on them or not. I think it would be important that we just find out what, what are the workings of it. Yeah, no, I'm happy to program that in. That was a huge piece of legislation. Thank you. <coughs> okay, so members, in respect to these three statutory rules, if you're content, I'll just work through um, each of them. SR 2019, then 165, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 165 
the Review Tribunal Amendment Rules, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. And the next one, uh, that the Committee for Justice consider SR 2019-191, the Review Tribunal Revocation Rules, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. 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 <coughs> and finally, the committee, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019-202, the Review Tribunal Amendment Number 2 Rules, Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, hey, members, thank you. The next uh, item on the agenda is the Police Pensions Regulations, page 283 to 295 of your meeting pack. This rule makes uh, various technical amendments to the Police Service of Northern Ireland and the Police Service of Northern Ireland Reserve uh, Regulations 2006 and the Police Pension Regulations 2009 and the Police Pensions Regulations of 2015. The amendments ensure the following. Uh, continued legislative provision for the deduction, deduct, deduction of employee contributions with effect from the 1st of April 2019. An amendment to the employer contribution level in line with the Department of Finance scheme of directions and finally removal of the requirement for completion of a nomination from unmarried survivors in line with the Supreme Court judgment in the case of Brewster. Uh, the rule is subject to negative resolution. If members are content, I will proceed to put the formal question. That the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 forward slash 54, the Police Pensions Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Next item is the Police Pension, again, uh, to do with uh, additional voluntary contributions of Police Pension Regulations, pages 297 to 306. Regulations amend the Royal Ulster Constabulary Police Pensions Amendment Voluntary Contribution Regulations 1993, which provided for an in-house additional voluntary contribution scheme. The amendments will enable continued payment of ABCs by police scheme members following the transfer from a previous provider, uh, namely Equitable Life, to Utmost Life and Pensions Limited. Uh, the rule is subject to negative resolution. If members are content, uh, with the statute of rule, I will put the question formally to the committee. Uh, that the Committee for Justice considered SR 2020 forward slash 9, the Police Pensions Additional Voluntary Contributions Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020, and subject to the Examiner for Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. <coughs> okay, members. Um, the next two statutory rules we will consider together in respect of uh, civil legal services regulations, pages uh, 308 through to 319 are the relevant papers within your meeting pack. The Department for Communities had responsibility for carrying out financial eligibility assessments in respect of representation, higher courts and applications for civil legal aid on behalf of the Legal Services Agency, Northern Ireland. These statutory rules make technical amendments to transfer the responsibility for the financial eligibility assessments to the Director of Legal Aid Casework, Legal Services Agency, from the Department of Communities, as recommended uh, by uh, the Access to Justice Review report that was published in 2011. Uh, the former Minister for Justice, Claire Sugden, had given ministerial approval for the transfer. The regulations also amend an anomaly in the general regulations by transferring responsibility for assessing financial eligibility uh, for exceptional funding to the Legal Services Agency, thus reflecting current practice. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution, and if members are content, I will formally put these questions to the Committee. That the Committee for Justice considered SR 2019 the Civil Legal Services General Amendment Regulations, Northern Ireland, 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The next rule, 2019-14, uh, is subject to negative resolution. If members are content, I will proceed with putting the formal question to the committee. 
that the Committee for Justice has considered SR 2019 forward slash 14, the Civil Legal Services Financial Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, members, the next item um, relates to the Civil Legal Services Order, pages two, 321 to 331 in the meeting pack. Uh, this makes a number of minor technical amendments to correct a number of errors and admissions in the Civil Legal Services Remuneration Order, Northern Ireland 2015. These include amendments to table headings, extending the references to letters to include emails where appropriate, inserting a new table to highlight and reflect those payments currently being paid to a solicitor in certain county court proceedings when proceedings have been withdrawn, abandoned or discontinued, and making provision for the payment of travel time and mileage in all relevant proceedings, indicating the payments currently made. <coughs> the rule also introduces two changes, the first to improve the arrangements for a solicitor claiming an interim disbursement payment for an expert witness report, and the second to facilitate the ability of counsel to submit their claim for costs and interim costs directly. The rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in June of 2019, and if members are content, then I will proceed to make uh, the formal question that the Committee for Justice uh, has considered SR 2019 forward slash 119, the Civil Legal Services Remuneration Amendment Order Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules report, has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. agreed. Okay, the Legal Aid for Crown Court Proceedings Amendment, pages 333 to 338. This statutory rule amends the Legal Aid for Crown Court Proceedings uh, Rules 2005 to introduce new provision for the payment of a time-based fee in respect of fine enforcement referral hearings in the Crown Court as a result of the implementation of the new fine collection and enforcement arrangements, which we uh, considered earlier. The fixed fees for fine enforcement referral hearings at the Crown Court is set out in the rules. The fee will depend on the representative, including the category of counsel instructed as applicable, and on the duration of the hearing. Referral hearings occur when a court has imposed a financial penalty. The person liable to pay the penalty is in default, and that person's case has been referred back to the court responsible for enforcing payment of the penalty. Uh, the rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in June of 2019. So if members are content, I will proceed to put the formal question to the committee. Uh, that the Committee for Justice has considered SR 2019 forward slash 122, the Legal Aid for Crown Court Proceedings Costs Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Next item is Magistrate Court's uh, Amendment uh, Statutory Rule, page 340-345 of the meeting pack. This statutory rule makes a uh, new provision for the payment of a fixed fee of £75 for representation at a fine enforcement referral hearing at a magistrate court. As outlined previously, referral hearings occur when a court has imposed a financial penalty. The person liable to pay the penalty is in default, and that person's case has been referred back to the court responsible for enforcing payment of the penalty. The statutory rule is subject to negative resolution. It was laid in June of 2019. If members are content, then I will put the question formally to the committee. Uh, that the Committee for Justice has considered SR 2019 forward slash 123, the Magistrate Courts and County Court Appeals, Criminal Legal Aid Costs Amendment Rules Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. Agreed. The next uh, agenda item uh, relates to Again, civil legal services regulations. For this item, I have asked uh, officials just to come to the committee so they can make their way. Uh, the pages for members are 347 to 352 of your meeting pack and also page 150 to 155 of the tabled papers that you have in front of you. This statutory rule will exempt certain applications for advice and assistance in potential proceedings or representation in certain proceedings or potential proceedings before 
the Review Tribunal under the Mental Capacity Act of 2016 from financial eligibility assessments. Uh, and so, members, I just wanted to ask officials some questions um, in respect of this, um, because it is removing the financial eligibility criteria. Uh, from reading through the papers, the estimated cost of doing this was somewhere between half a million, six hundred thousand pounds, uh, and so I just wanted to get a better understanding as to to why we're removing or the department wants to remove this eligibility test in these cases. Stephen, yes, um, chair, thank you. Uh, there are probably two two reasons. Uh, as a general principle in legal aid remuneration, where somebody's liberty is at stake. Uh, usually, financial eligibility um, rules are, are, are set aside. So, for example, in criminal proceedings, that's why uh, largely financial elig eligibility is not a, a major consideration. This this is also a deprivation of liberty case. So, it's it's a, a similar type of uh, of situation as in as in the as in the, the criminal arena. I suppose the second thing is the the existing mental health review tribu tribunal set up under the 1986 order also has similar provisions. Financial eligibility is set aside in that tribunal. So we felt it would be odd to not do the same uh, in this, this extended, uh, extended tribunal. So that's the, that's the rationale, Chair. OK, so it, it happened before. It, it, it was the case before that the eligibility criteria was not applicable, and that's just being carried forward into yes. the, the, the new regime. Absolutely. And, uh, how many cases is anticipated where this this could happen in order to have got the the, the figures of approximately six hundred thousand in terms of the costs that would be associated to legal aid on this? How was that achieved? Yeah, the the, the six hundred thousand pounds refers to our upper estimate for the total costs of providing legal aid for these proceeding types. Um, that's based on uh, work that's been done by the Department of Health to try to estimate the likely case volumes coming forward um, for current ongoing deprivation of liberty cases. So we're estimating that in, in the initial period we might have up to 650 applications to the tribunal each year. So our £600,000 figure comes from an assumption that all of those cases would involve a grant of legal aid. Um, we suspect that that won't be the case. In fact, many of these, these, these will go forward. Without, without legal aid being granted. Um, not all of the legal aid expenditure is consequent on these regulations. Clearly, some of those people would have been eligible for legal aid in any case. Um, and waiving the financial eligibility test merely makes sure that all of the people who, who need legal aid in these proceedings have access to it. We don't actually have any figure work to give us an indication for this group of what, what proportion of those people would in any case have been eligible for legal aid, but the 600,000 therefore represents a, a, a maximum limit on the, on the consequential cost to the legal aid fund of the introduction of the, the new provisions in the Mental Capacity Act. Okay. Um, I'm going to bring that in, but I'm picking up just a wee bit of interference, members. If you can pull your phones back from the mics, that would be appreciated. Um, Linda? So just to clarify then, that 600,000 includes those who would have been entitled to legal aid anyway, and, yes. and it's highly unlikely that every single person is going to take a, a case that's going to take a, a bulk, The bulk of the cases that we expect to see coming through are going to be referrals made by the Attorney General on behalf of people who lack the capacity to take a decision about whether or not to appeal mm -hmm. a deprivation of liberty case. So these are people with very limited capacity. Uh, in respect of whom a, a, an application is made to the tribunal automatically or as a matter of course by the Attorney General. So many of those people can be expected not to require legal representation or to require legal aid for the purposes of those proceedings. Thank you. Okay. Patsy. Just to, to take that a, a stage further, uh, you were there whenever I raised some issues earlier that seemed to be in the system. We'll come to that at a, at a different occasion. Um, the extension of the legal aid takes you as far as the review tribunal. Yes. What if it what about the next step of this for their court proceedings as a consequence of that review tribunal? Um, well proceedings at the High Court are, would uh, you're ready to take a judicial review or further appeal. 
would be subject to a financial the standard test. <coughs> civil legal aid tests, the same tests that are there for, say, judicial review in the High Court, they remain. If there is an appeal by way of judicial review, it's the same financial eligibility test remains. Or if there's an appeal on the point of law to the Court of Appeal, again, it's the same legal aid test or, that still remains. Sorry, for I'm trying to get up. Or a challenge to the determination of the review tribunal. The challenge can come in one of two ways, on a point of law to the Court of Appeal or, like any other public authority, a challenge can be made by way of judicial review. Yes. But either of those two challenges, it's the same legal aid application that's made for any other type of case to the Court of Appeal or to for judicial review. So the financial eligibility for those tests still remains. Okay. Right. Okay, thanks, Chair. Okay. <coughs> any other questions, members? Can I thank you very okay. much for thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Okay, members, the rules subject to negative resolution, and if members are content, I proceed to put the question formally to the committee. That the Committee for Justice has considered SR 2019-203, Civil Legal Services Financial Amendment No. 2, Regulations, uh, Northern Ireland, 2019, and subject to the Examiner of Statutory Rules Report has no objection to the rule. Members agreed? Agreed. Okay, members, um, thank you for bearing with me as we went through those very technical but on some incidences very important uh, regulations by the committee. Um, do we know how many more, Christine, we need to consider as a committee? Um, well, that was 28 and there's three on for Thursday. 31, we've already done five. 36, um, there's a few that have, one has been withdrawn and there's a couple I think are actually not subject to procedure, so I think we're probably about 15 or okay. roughly. So we're, we're going to try and factor those statutory rules in for uh, this day week. Uh, again, uh, we'll, we'll meet at the same time um, and hopefully that will allow us to have got caught up on the statutory rules. Um, the meeting on Thursday begins at 2 o'clock and the Attorney General is coming to that meeting and will consider the three statutory rules uh, that that office had laid. Um, so that there's no other um, items just to consider in respect of that. Obviously, if I can just make a comment, the Minister has announced that she intends to bring forward the domestic abuse legislation to the Executive uh, rather than taking it through Westminster, which ultimately will then come uh, to this committee for its scrutiny role to carry out that important work, um, and there will be an opportunity to, to discuss that more on Thursday. I think, Linda, you had mentioned this earlier, just in, in terms of this coming through. Yeah, I just seen that it was um, the minister had put it out publicly this morning that, mm -hmm. that she intended to, to take it through. I mean, we had agreed, I suppose, the other day as a committee when we had talked about it that that probably would be the preferable route in terms of allowing us. The ability to scrutinise, and also that you know, was it really was the Westminster legislation really suited to to here in the way in which you'd want it to be? So I think that it probably is a good way to move forward as long as it's done in a timely. I think in the timely fashion of it's important. I had been speaking to the minister about this, um, and that was one of the assurances that I was seeking that you know, we would be able to. Um, take this through in a timely manner, uh, and the point has been well made that there are no guarantees that Westminster could actually put this through, and, and um, the legislation had been intended to be brought through and then subsequently delayed. Um, here we are able to put this through um, through our own procedures. Obviously, the committee has a very important role to do that, and we'll seek to do that, I think, in the most effective and timely manner. Um, but we do have an opportunity now to, I think, make legislation that's uh, bespoke to the specific needs in Northern Ireland. And I've noted uh, a number of the, the third sector voluntary organisations have wel welcomed this approach, as well as wanting to seek other offences added to it. And, and obviously, that's something the committee can consider, uh, given the opportunity that will now be afforded to us. So we, we'll pick up on that issue next Thursday, cause, or this Thursday, because I'm keen to find out exactly the time frames for that legislation to be put through the executive, which is the first stage, and then introduced to the Assembly. Okay, members, then um, we'll see each other on Thursday at 2 o'clock in room 30. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.